Okay, so that's a little bit on adipose tissue with the direct evidence of it contributing to obesity, even when calories were controlled, the effect on the blood vessels. Let's now talk a little bit about the liver. Lectins may harm the liver by promoting inflammation and insulin resistance. Now, to, to understand the effect on the liver, we actually have to have a bit of an indirect effect here too, which is leaky gut. A leaky gut allows bacterial endotoxins like LPS, lipopolysaccharide, to reach the liver. Remember, when you look, when you look at blood flow through the visceral space, what, when blood flows through the liver, it, uh, th rather through the gut, it then goes to the liver. So the liver is really on the front lines of what's coming in from the blood is going to get to the liver. So if we have a lot of endotoxins like LPS moving from the gut because of leaky gut, it, the liver is the one who has to really deal with it. So it's no surprise that if, if there is a leaky gut, the endotoxins will reach the liver which in turn activates the macrophages in the liver. And those are specifically called Kufer cells. And so these uh, liver macrophages get really primed for inflammation and start releasing a bunch of cytokines like TNF-alpha and C-reactive protein. But the hepatic or liver inflammation in turn impairs insulin signaling, creating hepatic or liver insulin resistance. This means more gluconeogenesis, less glycogenolysis, and more lipid synthesis. So the liver basically is getting loaded with glucose and loaded with fat. So no surprise that there's an increase in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In fact, a 2018 study in the Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry found high lectin diets increased liver fat and insulin resistance linked, no surprise, to elevated inflammatory markers. But it doesn't stop there. Lectins, like the wheat germ agglutin in WGA, can also induce oxidative stress in hepatocytes, liver cells, potentially causing mitochondrial dysfunction and contributing to steatosis or fatty liver. So in individuals with autoimmune predispositions, once again, lectins' molecular effects could trigger some specific liver issues. Now, one final big thing I wanted to mention about lectins is their role in uh, aggravating immune function. Lectins can stimulate immune responses. A 2015 paper in an autoimmune journal called Autoimmunity Reviews proposed that lectins act as, I like this word, molecular mimics. So, in fact, molecular mimicry is an area of research exploring how some of these unknown or previously unknown components or molecules of various carbohydrates can trigger cross-reactive antibodies that worsen autoimmune conditions. So this is basically just saying that the lectins are priming the immune system to start to recognize self or our own cells as foreign. A paper in 2019 found lentil lectins induced interleukin-6 production in human immune cells, which not only disrupted insulin signaling, but again, is just contributing to this overall pro-inflammatory, pro-autoimmune condition. Lectins' structural similarity, that's reflective of the molecular mimicry, to our own proteins can confuse the immune system. And... Like we, I, I mentioned the WGA, but also phytohemagglutinin. They can bind to the gut epithelial cells or immune cell receptors, and they can mimic some of our own proteins, which can prompt the production of autoantibodies or self-destructing antibodies. One of the other papers I have here highlighted how lectins can initiate or amplify autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus by stimulating T cells. The T cells are one of the critical white blood cells involved in immune responses. So this immune dysregulation may extend to not only systemic inflammation, where we can see elevations in cytokines in the blood, um, like C-reactive protein or TNF-alpha or the interleukins, but also contributing to liver dysfunction, adipose dysfunction, et cetera. But of course, the autoimmune link 
also ties to cardiometabolic health. Chronic inflammation from autoimmune activation increases cardiovascular risk as seen in conditions like lupus, where patients face higher rates of atherosclerosis. A 2017 study in clinical rheumatology noted that autoimmune-driven inflammation correlates with insulin resistance and endothelial dysfunction, both exacerbated by dietary factors like lectins in susceptible individuals. So once again, while we do have inherent mechanisms or cultural mechanisms to try to reduce these lectins, like just how we prepare foods, you never get rid of all of them. And the risk in those people who just tend to be a little more susceptible is very real. Okay, so let's get to some practical considerations. And I've been touching on this a little bit, but a lot of lectins effects on health, including all the things I've outlined, depend on the preparation, the dose of how much you're eating and individual susceptibility. Cooking methods like pressure cooking or boiling can significantly reduce a lot of these lectins, which is going to minimize the exposure and minimize the risk. But people with IBS or autoimmune conditions or insulin resistance or uh, plaque problems like atherosclerosis or high blood pressure may benefit from deliberately limiting these high lectin foods like controlling raw grains or legumes. In fact, that's an important point that while it's exceptionally uncommon for someone to eat raw legumes, it's not uncommon at all for people to eat more raw grains where they haven't gone through this process of, say, high pressure cooking. Systemic insulin resistance, inflammation, and cardiometabolic problems are influenced by a host of factors, but the drum that I beat so consistently is control carbs. Now, much of what I've discussed over the years with control carbs has been focused on the insulin effect of those refined starches and sugars. But we cannot ignore some of these more hidden aspects like lectins. Now, one thing you can do then is monitor biomarkers like fasting glucose and insulin, of course, but also high sensitivity C-reactive protein. That's going to be a pretty good one that may let you know, may give you some insight into whether you're eating something that's actually making your body have some kind of immune response. Now, a lot of the studies I mentioned are done in animals or cell culture with a little bit of human data. So we need more human studies to really quantify lectin's role in cardiometabolic health. But it is obvious in the limited data we do have and the abundant anecdotes that limiting lectins is going to be a generally helpful intervention.